Hello and welcome to another episode of Who Knew in the Moment, the podcast. I'm your host, Phil Friedrich, and today I am honored to have Whitney Weiser Savage with me. Whitney is the owner of Nashville Fit Show and Weiser Fit Life. Uh, she is a competitor. And then also in today's story with Whitney, uh, you're going to hear a story of resilience and facing your fears and not believing in the fears. So Whitney, thanks so much for being on today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. You bet. So to kick off your story, uh, we'd love to start back in the day of enjoying basketball. So talk a little bit about young, young Whitney being competitive and learning to love basketball. Yeah, so I started playing sports, which was basketball, when I was nine years old. I think I remember begging my parents, like, way before that to do gymnastics or cheerleading or something like that. And my dad was like, mm, you're not going to do cheerleading. You're going to play a real sport. <laughs> you're I'm like, okay, <laughs> let's do it. So um, I started playing basketball when I was nine years old, um, just church league. My mom, I remember my mom and my aunt were the coach of the team. It's like yeah. starting out and I was not good at all, like at all, but I was determined to be good. So I just practiced and practiced and practiced constantly. And after a couple of years, I got better and better and I did become a lot better, but it took a lot of practice and I played on several teams uh, throughout the year, like year round basketball every year. So that was definitely my first love. Um, when I got to high school, I played more sports like volleyball, track and field, basically anything else I had any time for, but basketball was always my first love. Yeah. And so, you know, as you mentioned, when you're starting out as a young individual, it's really just about the sport. But as you get a little bit older, they start introducing the idea of weightlifting and strength training. So talk about that getting introduced to your life uh, really as a piece of a sport, but uh, a passion that you then end up finding there. Yeah. Um, so our high school basketball coach got us a trainer um, in the off season. I think I was 15, maybe going on 16 uh, when we got this trainer and I knew nothing about weightlifting and I really didn't love the workouts at first. Um, I kind of understood them. I'm like, okay, well, if this is going to help me be better at basketball, then I'll do it. You know, I'll, I'll give it my all. Um, so you know, it was, it was rough. I remember just being so freaking sore. Like I'd never <laughs> been so alive because we were doing like bench press squats, deadlifts and all this other stuff. And, uh, that my body wasn't used to. So I was super sore, but I started seeing results pretty quickly because I was so new to it. And any time you introduce something new to your body, you're going to see results a little bit quicker. Yeah. And so that kind of fueled me. I was like, okay, I kind of like this. I love strength training, um, training legs. Cause that's where I saw the most uh, results is in my legs. So that's when I first got introduced to it. I, it wasn't like a main thing to me because yeah, I still had basketball, I still had all that. And it wasn't until I got to college where I didn't play like organized sports. I played intramurals. So I was still heavily active playing sports, but that's when I started actually weight training a little bit more um, because fitness was just such a huge part of my life that just made me feel good to work out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so talk a little bit about that, you know, for anyone that's listening, that is maybe uh, reluctantly saying, Hey, I've been meaning to get into the gym or I've been meaning to get back into the gym, but I don't want to go through that sore part. Right? I don't want to, you know, just get started. What would be an encouragement piece to somebody that's, you know, on a fitness journey or should wants to start a fitness journey? I would say the first thing is to get extremely clear on your goals, mm -hmm. uh, because just going to the gym, like without a plan and without goals, well, it's not going to last. Yeah. You know, nobody's going to stay if you don't know what you're doing it for. So the first piece I would say, get extremely clear on your goals, exactly what you want to accomplish, um, whether that's a certain way you want to look, a certain way you want to feel. It should encompass more than just the physical aspect. Like, what do you really want to accomplish with it? And then once you get clear on that, come up with a plan, but ease into it. I think the biggest mistake I see beginners make is, They've got, they've got the motivation at first. They want to go all in, but they go too hard. And then they're so sore, they can't move. And after a week, they're like, forget this. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, well, don't do that. You don't have to go to extremes. Just ease in and try to make it part of your life instead of just 
like doing a complete overhaul and going from working out no days a week to six days a week. Like this is not going to work. So I say just ease in, um, make it part of your life. And um, also having a plan is important, but remaining flexible within the plan is sometimes important too. I see a lot of people, like if they mess up, mess up on their plan or they miss a meal or they miss a workout or something then it's like everything just goes to hell in a handbasket at that point instead of being like okay I miss you know I ate something I wasn't supposed to okay yeah. let's learn from this and just move on from it um one of my favorite <laughs> analogies to use is like if you get one flat tire driving down the road you don't go pop the other three and have like, why would you do that? That's the same thing with nutrition. Like you eat one bad thing. Why would you just eat crap for the rest of the day or the rest of the week? It's the same thing. It makes no sense. Just get back on track and, and keep moving forward. Perfect. So <laughs> for you, you had, you start to get really into it and you start to have this goal of the opportunity to compete. So talk about how that came and that idea was introduced into your life. Yeah. So I didn't know anything about bodybuilding. I didn't even know that existed really. Um, I was about to graduate college actually. And I was bartending downtown Nashville and a trainer walked in and saw like how athletic my build was already. And he just mentioned, he's like, Hey, have you ever thought about competing? And I'm like, compete, compete in what? Like, <laughs> what do you mean? And he's like bodybuilding. And I'm like, what in the world is that? <laughs> and, uh, he's like, I have a figure competitor. Let me show show you you know what it is and so he showed me a picture on his phone of his client on stage and I was like ew I don't want to look like that <laughs> and so it was just so weird to me but yeah. this was planted in my mind and I'm like god that was weird but that looked interesting it looks like a challenge and I like challenges so it just kind of stayed in my mind for several weeks until I was just like okay I texted him and I was like, okay, so this competing thing, like, what do I do to get started? <laughs> I'm just kind of filling it out. What do I do? And he said, meet me at the gym. I'll take you through it, whatever. And so he wrote me a diet, started training me and I just eased into it. Uh, but it was rough. <laughs> like I went from like a college bartender lifestyle to a competitor lifestyle, which is not the same at all. And yeah. so it, that was a complete shift. Um, and I had a goal in my mind, but it was still hard to stay focused on that goal because I had never been on stage before. I had never even been to a show before. I didn't know I was clear on my goal. Well, no, I was kind of clear, but <laughs> I thought I knew what I wanted, but it was, it made it really hard because I just couldn't understand like why I had to be so strict on my eating and why I couldn't drink alcohol and like all this, I'm like vodka soda has no no calories right and he's like no it does not benefit you you cannot this is different so I um I went through that first prep and I I lost like 15 pounds during that it was only eight weeks which is a short prep for a show and um I cut a few corners I didn't give it my all every single day, I would say. So I got on stage for the first time and I got second place, which was good, but I was not happy <laughs> with that. I'm competitive. <laughs> and I think the main thing, the reason why I wasn't happy and I was actually like really angry and frustrated about it is because I wasn't frustrated at the other competitors or the judges or anything like that. I was frustrated at myself mm -hmm. because I just knew there were things that I hadn't just done a hundred percent. And if I would have, I probably would have won. And so that lit a fire in me that like, just kept me going for years after that, honestly, like I was all in. And I started from that moment on prepping for a whole year out for the next show. And I was, so I was in it at that point, but I guess sometimes it takes um, messing up, doing things the wrong way, and then seeing what could have been to really start maximizing on, you know, your potential. So. Nailed it. Now I want you to highlight that. I think for a lot of people, we have this goal, right? And we have, we know what we really want, but we're not willing to let go of some of the things that aren't serving our next goal. So talk about that for yourself, but also for others that are really trying to accomplish goal, but aren't willing to let go of the things that, that they're used to. 
Man, that that is hard. And we could talk about this from every aspect of life, not yeah. just fitness, but man. Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, I think if you truly, truly get crystal clear on your goals, not only your goals and what you want to accomplish, but why, why mm. you want to accomplish it. I think that's when it gets to a deep enough level where you can even begin to start letting things go that aren't serving you. Yeah. Um, like for example, you know, my goal back then was to compete, get on a bodybuilding stage to win. Okay. That's great. But some people might have goals of, you know, I want to be able to serve in a higher capacity. Like if you're going on, you know, missions, like, yeah. uh, going to Ukraine, like at this time, if you want to help in situations like that, you need to be at a certain physical capacity, mental com- capacity, emotional, like on all levels. And so if something like that is your why, which we all have a why, we all have a deeper, you just have to get there. Once you outline that, like you're going to start letting things go that don't serve that because your goal is too important and the why is too important. And we'll get into my story in a minute, but another like deep reason and why for me is the the reason why I want to accomplish certain things in life is because I want to just inspire strength and confidence in women. And that's why I share my story um, is to just give, give hope, I guess, give hope for everybody to overcome um, whatever they're going through. And that's, that's what sharing our story does. So we will get into that more in a minute, I'm sure. (laughs) But yes. So as you continue to progress and compete, you do start hitting goals and uh, talk about the progression for you. Yes, it finished second in the first competition, but uh, you keep going on. Um, so I kept going on after that. Um, I kept getting second place too, even after I went all in, like I was just kept getting second place. I'm like, okay, now I'm really frustrated <laughs> because I'm doing everything possible. And so I, um, somebody mentioned to me, they're like, why don't you try competing at the next level? You're qualified to compete there, even though you haven't won, you know, second place, the top two, you still qualify. Why don't you go to the next level? Just see what the judges say um, and, you know, go from there. And I was like, at first I was like, no way, if I can't even win a show locally, Mm. like why? But then I was, I, I got to a point where I was so frustrated that I was like, you know what? I have nothing to lose. Why not? So <laughs> I, uh, I started, I started prepping for the national level show and I just, I was laser focused. Like I had nothing to lose. I just wanted to do the best I could possibly do. And that's what, where my mindset was. I didn't really go into it with expectations, um, of winning or anything like that. I had a goal of top 15, which is a really conservative goal, but I thought it was realistic for me because I've never been to that level. So I prepped as hard as I can. I showed up and it really, my confidence showed on stage because I just really had nothing to lose. And I had fun on stage and I ended up winning. Like I won my class. I know, right? The yeah. first level show. Um, so I won my class, but I didn't win the overall. And when you win the overall at a national level show, that qualifies you, you become a pro athlete. Mm. And so I won my class, but I didn't win the overall, but I was like that close. And so I was like, wow, okay, I can actually be good at this. <laughs> so I competed. I did another one four weeks later um, in Chicago. I was traveling all over the country. I was winning like back to back shows, but losing by like that much on actually turning pro, which had never even been a goal of mine because I just thought it was too far, far fetched. Wow. But then I got so close to it. I'm like, okay, this is possible. This is my goal now. And so I, winning your first couple national level shows is just not normal in our industry usually. And so I was getting a lot of national recognition, like for Flex Online Magazine and and things like that. They were writing articles about me, just basically about this girl that came in from nowhere and nobody out of nowhere. They didn't say it like that, but that's what it was. (laughs) winning all these shows they're like who is this and like I was named like the one to watch to turn pro that year it was just so much for me because I'm from a small town like I never had that level of success so in that world everything was going great Um, in my personal life everything was not so great I had just made the decision to leave a really abusive relationship that was just toxic and I was young at the time, but I knew like at some point, like, I'm like, this is just out of control. This is not good. So 
I made the decision to leave and uh, my ex wanted to, a week later, he wanted to talk about things and maybe getting back together. And I was like, this is a waste of time, but sure. And I said he could come up to my job and, and meet me in the parking lot and we'd talk about it. So uh, I was on my lunch break. I went out, we talked for five minutes and I was basically like, this is, this is not good for either of us. You know, it's a waste of time. Like, yeah. and I could get out of the vehicle, the SUV, I start walking back across the parking lot and he pulls out of the parking space in a rage, just floors it toward me and actually hits me as I'm walking and runs me over with his SUV. And so when I went under the vehicle, it dragged me across the parking lot. And then whenever, whatever was holding me under the vehicle, let me go. The rear tire rolled over my midsection and crushed my spine. And so I was just left there in the parking lot. And luckily there were two eyewitnesses. One saw the whole thing and called 911 right away. And the other one saw the last part of it, but he just happened to be a former EMT. Hmm. So um, divinely put there from God, I believe a hundred percent, because if he hadn't have been there, I would no doubt be paralyzed today because I was in so much pain. I never lost consciousness. I have no idea how, but I was in so much pain that I didn't know what to do. I would have tried to get up and walk because we, I didn't know, like, right. I didn't know my spine was crushed. I just know everything hurt so bad that I could barely breathe, but I would have tried to get up and I would have been paralyzed, but he wouldn't let me move. So, um, I got transported to the hospital, had to undergo emergency back surgery, had metal rods and screws inserted into my spine. And it just, all this happened like in a moment, basically. Yeah. And it's like, one minute I I'm the strongest I've ever been in my life. And then the next minute I can't even walk by myself. So that was a harsh reality that really didn't sink in right away. Even yeah. when I, when I got uh, released from the trauma unit, my parents were there and they were, we were, they were taking me back to live with them, which is about an hour or so from where I live. And I was like, why, why, am, why are you taking me to your house? Why aren't you just going to take me back to my apartment? And my dad is like, you cannot walk. You can't walk by yourself. And it still just wasn't sinking in. Yeah. I had never experienced that. And I was like, oh, so the road to recovery was really rough. Um, learning how to walk again, just, oh, it was a lot. And um, throughout that process, I didn't even know I was doing this consciously at the time, but I was, I was reading, I was filling my mind with like positive things. Yeah. I would, and when I was learning to walk again, um, eventually within a few weeks, I was, that's all I could do is walk while I was recovering. Cause my parents would be at work all day. I can't really do anything besides watch TV, but I could get to the point where I could stand up and start walking by myself. So I would end up walking like around their block all day long. And so while I was walking, I would just listen to music and I would visual, visualize myself back on stage, like wow. very clear picture of me on stage just going through the movements and being compared and, and winning. And like, I would go through everything in my mind. And so yeah. visualization is just, was so important to that. And, um, and I knew, I knew God would not let like all that go to waste what happened to me. And yeah. so I just, I had to believe. And even when the people around me, like it didn't seem possible to anybody for me to ever compete again. I was told I would never compete again, yeah. but I had to keep that mindset of, yes, I am. Like, I don't care what anybody says. This is what's going to happen. I've already seen it. I've already seen it in my mind. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was a struggle. I just had to block out all the negativity and focus on the positive and focus on doing what I could do because I had just deadlifted like my PR ever, like the day before that happened. And then it was, it was a uh, shot to my ego, I'll say, yeah. to not be able to do that kind of stuff. I, right. I almost felt invincible. And then I can't, I can walk like, and I right. can five pound dumbbell. I can't even do anything. So I think easing back in back to my fitness advice for yeah. people, just don't focus on what you can't do, focus on what you can do and just build up from there. So it was a process. Yeah, there's a lot I want to unpack through that. Um, first would be, you know, you talked about when it happened, 
the thoughts of why me, right? And a little bit of, we'll just call it victim mentality were, were originally there. How did you progress through that? Were there people in your life that were encouraging you? Was it a book you read? Was it something you heard? How did you kind of go from why me to, all right, it's time to visualize where I want to go from here? Um, I really have to give all the credit to God because none of the, my ability to move forward so quickly, like is just not humanly possible. And I forgave him within mm within a couple of weeks, maybe. Wow. And that's just not humanly possible. So I have yeah. to give that credit to God because there's just no way. And so I, I forgave him for, for what he did. And that also allowed me to move forward. I really didn't stay in the, the victim mindset very long at all. Um, now, of course, there's always moments where we revert and like, you know, in the moment, sometimes I would go back and forth, but I, I really worked hard to stay focused on the positive. Um, I read a book by Joyce Meyer called Power Thoughts that really, really helped me at that time. Um, I was really new to my relationship with God at that point, but I, I believed and I had faith and that's, that's what got me through. Yeah. So you know, we did skip that part uh, when we started into the relational side was, I believe, about a year prior, you had started going to a non-denominational church. Talk about what led you there and the, the relationships that, that you were able to forge while you were there. Yeah. So it's kind of ironic that my ex is the one that mm. took me to church there. So <laughs> it's really weird. But I had grown up Catholic, which is very different, very, very different. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say that. I think some people know. And uh, I never had a relationship with God. I never read the Bible. I never even listened in church um, growing up because it yeah. was Catholic. And I just, I didn't, it was more about like rules and do this if you want to yeah. be saved, do this if you want to get to heaven. And I was just like, I'm not a rules person. I don't like that. So <laughs> When, uh, when I started going to Cornerstone, uh, the non-denominational church, it was just so different. Like everybody just wore whatever they wanted to church. It wasn't like a big show of yeah. who can dress the best and wear the nice. It was just everybody just came as they were. And we're really just trying to get to know God, have a relationship with God and, you know, be the best they could be. And that was so new to me. Mm. And so it definitely... I, I didn't, I liked it at first. It just took getting used to, cause I wasn't used to that, to knowing that God, <laughs> um, yeah. but yeah, that's, that's really what started, um, my journey and, and my relationship with God and my faith. Amazing. While you're recovering, you, you mentioned, Hey, there were milestones, right? I was able to walk. I was able to walk around a block. I was able to get in a weight room and talk about having goals that are maybe not the ultimate goal, but you know that you need to accomplish the small wins to get to the ultimate goal for you. Mm -hmm. At that time, I, I, I had to just be focused on the stage and I had to set a date. I'm like, I probably rushed the process a little bit too much still, even for the situation. But um, normally when something not so traumatic happens and you're trying to reach a goal, it is important to stay focused on the, the smaller goals and, and the little wins. And I like to look at it as focusing on the process or process goals more so than outcome goals. Like simply get if, if drinking water, well, drinking water is really hard for a lot of people. I have no idea why it's never been. A <laughs> but for some people, it's like, oh, I can barely get down 16 ounces a day. And I'm thinking, how are you still alive? But that's a whole, <laughs> that's a whole other topic. Um, but like if water, if getting in your water is a struggle and you actually get in your minimum 64 ounces one day or whatever, celebrate the victory. Like you yeah. did, you that was, it seems small, but it's that your water intake is so important to no matter what your overall goal is, that's really important. So any day you get, you reach your goal, like celebrate the win, have those little things in place where you can say, Hey, I got my water in today. I that's winning. Or yeah. I, I stuck to my meal plan today. I got my workout in today. Like I, and even now, like if I get my workout in for the day, 
nothing bad can happen. Like I will handle it. I'm because I'm already winning for the day. I got my workout in. That's how I think now. Yeah. <laughs> like, no matter what it was, I did it. And so when you focus on the inputs that like that, you're going to get to the goal and you're going to enjoy the journey and the process. And it's going to become a lifestyle. It's not going to be like, Oh, I got to go work out now. Let me stop my life and go do this. Like, no, it's part of your life. It's not the separate thing. So yeah, staying focused on the small goals in between is really important too. Yeah. Now, as I want you to talk about the first competition back and the outcome, but also that tough moment of where I had been versus where I'm at. Yeah. So I rushed it probably a little bit too much. Um, I go back to the very same show that I had just won the previous year. So I get back on stage, don't even place. I go back to the second show that, you know, a year later, back to back, didn't place again, didn't place. I go from winning to not placing. And that was so devastating um, yeah. because it's like, you know, am I going to get there? Am I going to get back in those seats of doubt? Like try to start creeping back in. Um, and it was, it was hard, but my hope of turning pro and getting back to the stage was the only thing that I had at that point. Mm. And I just, I started prepping again for the next year. I'm like, okay, it's just going to take more time. I'm going to keep going. Like, this is the only option for me. This is my goal. I'm going to accomplish it. The plan might have to change, but the goal stays the same. I'm going, I'm going for it. And so it took an extra two years yeah. to get there, but, and there was a lot of, a lot more devastating <laughs> defeats in that time period. But, um, I finally got to the point where I was competitive again. I was back placing in the top three, top five at every national level show in the country eventually. And so then I'm like, okay, okay, I can do this. And so it's building my confidence back up. And I ended up getting my pro card, um, three years after. Um, so it, the journey became a little bit longer <laughs> because of had to, having to learn how to walk again and, and go through that, but I still accomplished it. And so it was a journey. <laughs> yeah. Well, and throughout the whole time, right, we've talked about your competitive nature uh, from nine years old till today, right? But why, why keep going? I, I won it last year. I didn't place. I didn't place. You know what? Maybe this just isn't for me. What was it about you and just the way you are that said, no, keep going. It's just going to take more time. And it's that stubborn nature. <laughs> Pro and a con to that stubborn nature, right? It's not always a good thing, but it has <laughs> served me well in many things. And um, yeah, I just stubborn, resilient. Um, and that has always been me is just, I'm just going to do it. Like no matter what, I will, I will make it happen. And I think a lot of people today give up a little bit too easily. It's like, if you want something, fight for it, like fight for it, be defiant. Like that's kind of looked at as a bad thing, but it actually can be a good thing if it's a productive, if it's, you know, going in the right direction. Um, and so like be defiant, fight for your goals, fight for what you want. Sometimes that's what it takes, like prove that you actually want it. Like, don't give up. So that was kind of my whole mentality. And that's just what I was used to from playing sports my whole life. So. Yes, that's awesome. I, I think your, your point is spot on. Sometimes we, we want something, but the second that an obstacle becomes in the way, we say, oh, well, maybe that's just not for me. I'll turn and pivot. And yep. don't get me wrong. There is times in life where pivoting is necessary, right? Um, we, we can't just always, you know, bang our head against a cement brick wall, but sometimes it's just, we haven't gone hard enough to get to that goal. Yeah. Yeah. And there's always different ways. Like just because there's, there's more than one way to reach a goal. So yeah. that's usually the case. Like maybe you've tried one or two ways, but like, don't give up, just try another way. Like yeah. there are more ways and more opportunities and you can keep trying, like, as long as you're still alive, like just keep going. It's not over. You bet. Within your circle, how do you structure friends and coaches and how do you listen to their advice versus <laughs> having your own stubborn thoughts? How do you kind of mix and match all of that for you? Oh man, this has really changed um, yeah. from 10 years ago to the past couple of years. Um, yeah. I'm 
extremely intentional about um, who I allow to speak into my life at all. Mm. Um, there's just, <laughs> I think I've just made it so clear, like as of recently, like I don't want unsolicited advice. If you are no. not like in my inner circle <laughs> of people, um, I'm not going to listen. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and that, that was one really hard thing that I think another thing I had to overcome over the years is people always have ideas for what they think you should be doing with your life. Oh, you should do this. You should do that. Like, and most of the time they are still great opportunities that, you know, and great ideas that people are saying, but it might not be what you're called to do or your purpose in life. And yeah. so again, like, figuring out your goals and your why, like, what is, what do you want to accomplish in your life? And what is your why behind that? Um, I am hosting retreats. I have a bodybuilding show now. I'm doing all these things and events because I want to speak life into women. I never want a woman to go through the pain that I've had to suffer because of bad decisions and toxic relationships. And so that why is so deep rooted for me that my goal is important. Um, yeah. So I'm going to keep going on that. And when you get to that deep level of not only what you want to accomplish, but why, again, you're going to keep going, even when you I, have bad days. I think that's amazing advice. You know, two things that I would just kind of piggyback on there. One is, uh, I heard it said once, uh, most uh, distractions are disguised as, as opportunities, yep. right? <laughs> right. Uh, hey, I, I'm focused on this one thing. Oh, flashy red thing. That seems kind of cool. Maybe I'll try that. And all of a sudden, the 100% effort you wanted for your first goal is now 70% towards that, 30% towards this thing that is not serving your top goal. So true. So true. Oh, man. I'm a, I'm part of a mastermind group, GeForce Mastermind Group. Yeah. And that's what we talk about all the time. And we having that group of people has been life-changing to me, mm -hmm. too, because we get clear and we are reminded constantly, like, why are we doing this? You know, what, what purpose does this serve? And that has honestly been the game changer in my life. And looking at, I have a lot of opportunities that come my way all yeah. the time. So yeah. it gets really difficult because I'm like, they're all great opportunities <laughs> or they're all at least good, but they yeah. might not be the opportunity. And no. so saying no, like, from somebody like me, like I like to do all the projects, all of them all at once. Right now we have to do this. That's my personality. And so yeah. I'm getting more intentional about, okay, this project sounds so fun. I really want to do it, but I can't do it in this season because I have to stay focused on this or that or whatever, but we'll circle back on that in a few months. Yeah. And me even, that's a win for me in my life because yeah. I've never been able to do that until like maybe the last couple of years. So. Well, well, and there's power in that. I think it's so interesting how we have these different like phases of our life or our business where there's early phases where you really probably should say yes to about everything because you just don't have a lot of doors that are open for you because of age or, you know, opportunities. And then on the flip side, you get further down the road where all of a sudden you have to say no to things. And uh, I heard it, uh, we had a gal on the show and she goes, Phil, if it's not a hell yes, then it's a hell no. You know, like there, there, there's no, you know, there's no in betweens. It's not like, ah, eh, that sounds kind of good. It's like, no, if it's not a hell yes, then it's just, it's off the table for, for this time, right? I can revisit in a few months, but right now it's a no. I love that. I'm going to, I'm going to remember that and say it all the time. <laughs> you betcha. You betcha. Now you get to compete and you get to qualify for the Miss Olympia and talk about that. I mean, that's kind of the pinnacle of the, the sport. Uh, big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So for those listening that don't know, the Olympia is like the Super Bowl of bodybuilding. <laughs> like only the best athletes in the world qualify to compete yeah. there. And again, that was never a goal of mine. Um, it was after I turned pro, it was like, I would joke around about it. I'm like, yeah, I would love to get to the Olympia just so I can get the Olympia jacket because that's what I really wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted the jacket. Um, but I, um, it, it just never was a tangible goal for me, I guess. Um, I competed in my first six, yeah, first six pro shows, didn't even place top five in any yeah. of them. But I come into the seventh pro show and I win the whole thing, which qualified me for the Olympia. And that's how bodybuilding works. So like, yeah. and that's what I tell competitors that I coach all the time. You cannot let one placing make or break you because you could show up 
two weeks later, a completely different judging panel, completely different um, athletes you're competing against, and the whole game just changed. Like you can go from last to first or first to last in the same month. So yeah. you can't let one placing make or break you. And so that was already my mindset. I already loved competing. It kept me disciplined in other areas of life. So I was going to do it and get my all no matter what. So qualifying for the Olympia was just like the, like you said, the pinnacle to me, I was like, oh my God, I have made it. <laughs> finally. And so my only goal for that was my goal wasn't to win the Olympia, but it was to look the best I've ever looked in my life and be yeah. competitive with the best athletes in the world to, to have so much fun, which sometimes when it's almost like a career that kind of loses your focus. And it had for me for a long time. So I was bound and determined to have fun and actually be present enough to enjoy the whole experience. Yeah. And I accomplished that. And so it was, it was the best. <laughs> It's such an amazing opportunity and a testament, right? You you look back and you say, gosh, at some point, someone told me I wasn't even going to step on stage again. And here I am being able to compete at the, the pinnacle of this sport, this profession. And yeah, I mean, that has to be a very just unbelievable moment standing on the stage and be like, I am here. Yeah, that's basically what I thought to myself. I had so much fun on stage. Um, it was just, it was great. And it was just so many thousands of people like watching. I was just soaking it all in. I was like, wow, I made it. This is amazing. <laughs> so. That's awesome. So as you are in this world, you understand the judging side and all of a sudden you say, well, maybe I could help judging, but you go to a competition and you are we'll just say disappointed in the uh, publicity that's provided for the, the athletes yeah. that are competing. And this sparks an idea. Yeah. So I'd already been judging uh, for quite, quite a while because I just love the sport. So I wanted to be involved in every area. And I, at the same time, I knew my competing days were coming close to an end. I'd already been competing for like seven or eight years, every year, nonstop. And like with my back and everything, I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to ease up at some point and yeah. I knew my competing days were coming to an end. So I was already, it was already in my head. Like, how can I, I love this sport though. Like, how can I still make it part of my life? And so judging was one way to do that. But, um, then, so I was judging at a show, a local show, which doesn't exist anymore. So I can talk about it, but, um, <laughs> it, it, it was a show that the promoters just really didn't under they had never competed before they didn't understand the sport they were definitely in it for just the money and when that's the main reason for you to do something like it's just not going to be as good as mm -hmm. like when you're really trying to, to make something great um so there was one dinky banner on this stage and i'm just looking at the stage like oh my god this is horrible like these athletes deserve so much more than this like yeah get some like lighting, some digital screens on stage, like make it, you know, like, like an Olympia stage, but at a local level, like this might be their Olympia. This might be right. the only time they ever compete, like make it great. And so I just got so fired up all of a sudden, like out of the blue for this. And I'm <laughs> like, I thought to myself, I could do a better show than this. And that's, I didn't even really realize what I said to myself, but apparently I planted a seed in my brain because it just kept like, uh, germinating or whatever the, the term is. Yeah. It's like, okay, it took root. And then I start talking about it and I start running it by people like, Hey, I got this idea. Um, and so that's, that's how it started going. I probably started telling people a little bit too soon about my idea, because I'm sure as we know, um, you kind of need to wait till the idea is like fully, you have the full vision for it sometimes, or just be careful who you tell, because they can plant seeds of doubt that, that are going to, kill the dream if you do it too soon so you got to really um, have a vision and protect it until like it's strong enough to like withstand yeah uh, any negative feedback and so I got a lot of negative feedback just our sport our bodybuilding sport is very male dominated and at the time very old school male dominated and so the idea for an all-female show was just absurd to them like absurd yeah. and they're like it's not going to be successful you're giving up half your prize or half your entry money because you're not allowing men and I'm like okay well let me worry about that just I need an approval for this right. a sanction approval and so 
it was, I, I got the approval and I, it's too crazy of a story to go through, but it's like, I, there's no way I should have gotten this approval as soon as I did. But because I had an idea that was outside the box and I had the right resources in place, um, I had already put down a deposit on a venue before I got an <laughs> approval. And so when you do things like that, people are like, oh, you're serious. Okay. And so things start falling into place. Yeah. <laughs> if you can have the faith to do that kind of stuff. I was scared to death. I'm just going to put that out there. I was scared, but I still did it. And so <laughs> I got the approval and I had no idea how to promote a show, how to do, I, I don't like my background is fitness. Um, I do have a degree in marketing, which I didn't know how much that would help me in this, but it helped me a lot but no event planning experience. And so I was just figuring it out as I went and it was stressful, but I made it happen. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. It's worked out well for you. It's paid off, right? Yes. Yes. It has grown into something that I couldn't have even imagined. So amazing. Additionally, and you hinted at it earlier, uh, you do some kind of traveling consultations and coaching sessions and group getaways. Talk about that and really what the focus is of your time when you're together. Yeah. So after, you know, I put the show together and what I started, my, my other goal was my main goal is to inspire confidence, confidence and strength among women. So that's the primary goal. But what I was seeing in the industry is everything was just outdated, like Mm. nothing, there was no information or resources to actually help a competitor be successful in a sport. It was just like, figure it out. And I, that's what I had to do. Um, But it took me many years. And I'm like, I have so much knowledge that I could just give and they don't have to make all the same mistakes I did. Yeah. And so I started putting out tons of information, like just on Instagram and things like that through the show. And I got so much feedback of like, this is amazing. Thank you so much. I had no clue where to even go for this stuff. And then I was like, you know what, I could just host like a little workshop and we can just talk about all this stuff in one day and I can reach a lot of people at one time and it'll be great. And so I started having workshops to um, just teach every, all aspects of competing. So from the posing, the posing is always what, what girls want to learn the most because it's just not natural and it takes a lot of practice. And so the posing, but we go over so much more like how to even pick out a suit, how to even hire a coach and what to look for in a coach. What's a good coach versus a bad coach. Um, Just going through budgeting for the cost of competing because it's an expensive hobby. I say it's an expensive (laughs) hobby. So, I mean, I started going through like all the information, like to help people be successful and it really took off. So um, that's most of the coaching that I do now is just group group events. I do one-on-one uh, posing coaching, like just posing sessions. I don't even do uh, much diet and nutrition stuff anymore. Cause I'm just, I can do it with my eyes closed. I'm just not that passionate about it because yeah. I want to get to the deeper stuff. Like, so now I talk about like, what's your purpose for competing? <laughs> like, yeah. what is your purpose for this? Let's, let's dive into that. And the reason why that part is so important to me is because when I stopped competing, I completely like went downhill because I lost my identity. I had placed my entire identity in being a competitive athlete. And when I was no longer Whitney Weiser, IFBB, Olympian, pro athlete, all the things, then I'm like, who am I? Wow. And it was, I had to go through a pretty dark process. And that's, that's why I want to talk about purpose and identity. And that's, that is my main goal in these workshops is to get them thinking deeper so that they don't have to deal with, again, my pain. Um, We all go through pain for a reason. So others don't have to, but we have to share um, what we know about, about it. And so that's my whole premise um, for the workshops, the show. And then my latest venture, which we talked about a little bit, uh, the retreats is like, I wanted to get even deeper with people. (laughs) So, so it's like, we can only do so much at these competitor workshops because they're still laser focused on competing and, and all this. And so I'm like, there's just so much more I want to cover. <laughs> um, yeah. And so having retreats, getting them out of their normal environment for a few days, um, like we're doing one in Costa Rica. We did one in Tulum, Mexico last year. Um, and who knows where I'll go next, but getting them out of their everyday environment really like 
helps them to think better and have a different perspective. Like, what do I want to accomplish in life? Instead of just going through the motions every day and, you know, just kind of on this inside feeling like, oh, well, there's got to be more to life. Um, and so that's what the retreats are for is to really go through the process that I did of like outlining your life exactly the way you want to create it and then working backwards to, okay, now how do I get there? So that's what I love to talk about. Yeah. I, I think what, what you said is so important, right? We, we tie who we are to something and typically it's what we're getting acknowledgement for, right? It could be your job. It could be for being a great spouse. It could be for being a great parent, uh, whatever it is. But when you tie your identity to something that you don't fully control, that's a very dangerous spot to be in because if you lose that, now who, who am I becomes the question, right? Yeah. And that's a tough one because everything is rooted like from your identity and your self image and all of that. So yeah, it's very, very important. Absolutely. Well, a last question I have to ask is we're in a tough relationship. We have the courage to get out and that is just a downward spiral. So many people will have a bad relationship, whether it's with the parent, the friend, the significant other, and that will cause this wall barrier to go up, impossible to break down to ever step into a next relationship and really be able to have what awesome opportunities can come from that. Talk about breaking through that for you and just being able to open yourself up to having a next relationship after such an experience that you had. Ugh. A uh, long process <laughs> for that, for yeah. sure. Um, I think what helped me the most was, um, and so a lot of people, this is just so common, and I did the same thing, is when you jump from relationship to relationship, you lose yourself, mm. usually, in those relationships, and then you don't really know who you are. Yeah. And, and a relationship is about two whole people coming together as one, not two halves, but two whole people. And so until you are fully whole and you know who you are and, and can go into a relationship, then you should take time to yourself. And I ended up doing that for a really long time um, because I was just, I had been through several more toxic relationships after that. I wish that was the last one, but I went through several more after that. Yeah. And so I got to a point where I started really um, discovering who I was and what my purpose in life was. And then when, once I really truly knew that I was not going to sacrifice my purpose for yeah. any relationship. And I knew that I wouldn't have to, if it was the right relationship. Mm. So I took a lot of time to myself. And during that time, you know, I spent a lot of time with God and realized that I had never known what real love was like mm. unconditional yeah. love. And my, I wasn't even able to receive love until I knew actually what that was, not just what it was, but understood it. It's, it's a difference yeah. in like head knowledge and like knowing what the definition of unconditional love is, yeah. but, but understanding it on a personal level and uh, just being able to receive it is a totally different thing. Yeah. So I, um, I finally got to that point where I, I was around different people and my mindset, I have to say this because this is so common. My mindset was like always, if somebody wanted to help me, well, they must want something in return. Like mm. they're not helping me for free. Yeah. Like, and that was the mindset. And after a while, it was just so foreign to me that somebody would want to help me <laughs> for like for nothing. And I'm like, I've never what is this? Like, what, right. no, like, what are your motives? Like I, that was always me because I'd never experienced like unconditional love, but I started getting around people that like, they genuinely just want to help. Yeah. And that started changing my perspective. Um, you know, along with God, God putting those people in my life. And I was, I just changed so much. Yeah. And so when I was able to receive love, then I was actually able to go into a relationship to give love because you can't give something you don't, you can't receive. Right. Yeah. And so that, that was the game changer for me. Um, and that's really only been over the past couple of years or so that <laughs> I've taken the time to really get alone with God and, and really go through healing, I guess. Man. Well, 
Whitney, I, I, I'm not shocked at our conversation today, but uh, so appreciative of you um, just being transparent about your journey, right? The, the amazing things you've accomplished, but some of the dark valleys you've had to go through. Uh, I always think people admire someone based on what they've accomplished, but they connect with someone based on their vulnerability. And uh, there's no doubt that uh, your transparency today is going to help a bunch of people alongside all the coaching you're going to get or that you're doing and you're going to continue to do. So thanks again so much for being on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I love sharing my story. And if it can just help one person, then that's the goal. So thank you so much.